A very good morning to everyone. Today we are going to look at the poem Crossing the Bar by Alfred Lord Tennyson, who was the poet laureate of his age. Crossing the Bar is a very relevant poem, especially in our current scenario, though it was written in 1889, three years before the poet's death. In the situation in which the world finds itself today, death has become a very important presence in our lives. And all of us, you know, you might have, you are all very young, but you might have heard elders, your grandparents talking about death. And you'll find that death often has a sense of trepidation. We are all very scared about how we are going to face death, what happens after death. These are issues that, you know, concern all of us. So today, this particular poem becomes very, very relevant because we're looking at a particular attitude of facing death, a death which is uh, an attitude, sorry, which is born out of the poet's belief. Uh, may we have the presentation, please? I shall begin while the presentation is coming. I shall begin by reading the poem for you. I hope all of you have your texts with you, reverie, and you can open to page 16. Crossing the Bar, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no morning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep, too full for sound and foam, when that which drew out from the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight, an evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness or farewell when I embark. From for though from out are born of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. All right, and let us look at the presentation now. And you'll see that some of the main points are there. We will elaborate on the presentation as we go along. So, as I said earlier, this was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson, one of the leading poets of the Victorian age. And if you listen very carefully, you'll find that it has the overtones of a hymn. As you listen to the poem, you're struck by the hymn, the calm, hymn-like quality as the poet ponders upon death. So, in a way, the poem can be considered a metaphorical meditation on death, all right? And the, it's in fact a complex and an extended metaphor. One can also call it an allegory. Journey to death is compared to gently crossing a sandbar between a coast area and the wide sea or the ocean. And you'll notice there's a lot of nautical images nautical terms. It's almost as if a sailor is speaking to you in this poem. May we have the next slide, please? Frightening. The slide, please. Frightening for most people. All right, you'll find in this poem, you'll find that the poet argues that it is a kind of comfort and it is based on the speaker's firm religious belief in a life after death so after no fear there's no darkness the uh, presentation please it does not therefore arouse fear in the mind of the speaker the poem was written as i've stated earlier in 1889 three years before the poet's death and it describes the poet's desire to die peacefully and calmly without fear, 
or bravest of souls perhaps we find that there is a sense of fear and as i said earlier a trepidation that is not there in this poem instead there is a deep faith the next uh, next uh, slide so you know the whole poem you'll see if you read it yourself and you'll find it emphasizes the frame of mind of the poet as he reaches old age thoughts of death occupy his mind and he talks about the frame of mind in which he wishes to face death and this is not new you've got a lot of poets who've talked about death if you have time i'll introduce you to some of the poets interestingly the ruling image of the poem is that of sailing or putting out to sea and i'd like like you to think about dover beach this again is a poem which is full of sea imagery and that particular poem also begins with the notes that the sea is calm tonight unfortunately this calmness is short lived because very soon the turmoil that the is in the poet's mind surfaces i'm sure you've all done dover beach in school by now so it surfaces and it finds its expression when the poet describes the incessant waves that are crashing on the shore and the no the waves now therefore the poem dover beach also the slide plays the theme of the human condition in uh, in contemporary times the poets writers and thinkers of the age were deeply disturbed by various things that were happening the sociological changes the rise of science and technology all that you know it shook the foundations of society and moreover charles darwin in 1859 published the origin of the species which talked about uh, the theory of evolution which was completely different from what the christian faith had so long said all right and it also talked about evolution being based on the survival of the fittest and this struck their contemporary thinkers very deeply most of them next slide most of them ex uh, they expressed gloom and certainty and anxiety the next slide please anxiety all born out of these terrible terrible changes that were taking place terrible for them for us very interestingly you know these changes showed us how society was progressing and i'll i'll, uh, I'll read out two lines a couple of lines from the other two poems that you've got in your course which will explain which will explain to you what exactly the poets were thinking about the poets were the thinkers of the age so atio arnold in dover beach says for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various so beautiful so new new hath really neither joy nor love nor light no certitude nor peace nor help for pain and we are here as on a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night a very very nihilistic a very very negative view of the world another poet who's been around the same time is thomas hardy and he writes the darkling thrush and he compares the whole situation the land around him and he gives uh, throughout the darkling thrush you find images of death of burial all that he uses words like specter he uses words like corpse all right so therefore he uses words like death lament now it is in this context that we must evaluate crossing the bar you know and the note in this poem is completely different the poet expresses a sense of calm belief and trust he is not shaken by thoughts of death 
as I said earlier, the poem is allegorical in nature. All right, as the poet describes, you can, if you did not know the background, you might also think of the poem, a poem which was written by a sailor who's con contemplating a voyage and the way he wants to uh, start his voyage. But there is, of course, the deeper undercurrent as we read the poem very, very closely. So let us look at the next slide and please have your books, uh, your texts with you because we're going to study the text. The first line of the poem itself establishes the sea motif as a po poet refers to sunset and evening star. Now, very often we've heard the term, I'm in the sunset of my life. All right. That is as you're approaching old age, you've crossed middle age and you're approaching old age, the sun of your life begins to sink. So it's sunset and evening star. Sailors need a star to sail their ships by. At least they used to do in the past. So they steer the ships according to the stars. And the evening star is actually the planet Venus, which moves through the skies. And it is a wandering star. And this suggests the journey of life, the movement of one kind of time to another, eventually ending with death. And it goes on um, in the next slide. It is interesting that the poet talks about, you know, he talks about the call of death as a clear call. Think about the word clear call. There's no confusion about the call. The poet knows very, very calmly, very clearly that this call is coming for him. The call indicates already for us the role that God will play later in the poem as God or the divine being, the supreme being, whatever you call it, is beckoning, is calling the speaker back to heaven. All right. And therefore, the po poem sort of the poet seems to describe the preparations of a ship that is putting out to sea. And he talks about the sandbar, you know, the currents uh, in, in, uh, in the waters. They, what do they do? They create a ridge of sand just as where the sea meets, the confluence of the coastal area or the sea, the harbor or the sea. And what happens when the waves lash against the sandbar? They make a very harsh sound. And perhaps the poet is referring to that. Next slide, when he says, and may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out the sea. All right. So the barrier symbolically, perhaps, you know, it's a barrier literally that the ship will have to cross when sailing out to sea. Symbolically, all the impediments, internal and external, which we have to overcome on our journey into death. Now, what are these impediments? Our own reluctance, our fears, our apprehensions, hmm? all that, you know, within us, that's within us. And externally, you know, the moaning, the crying, the unhappiness of the people around us who do not want to let us go. But the poet clearly states that there is should be no moaning of the bar. There should be no unhappiness, no fear, sadness, or hesitation as he sets out. He wishes to live calmly and in a happy state of mind does not want any kind of regret, any kind of unhappiness as he's setting out to see because, and we we'll come to that later on, because for the poet, get is a return. We'll come to that later on in the poem rather than a departure. All right. Yes, when we talk about the impediments, then there is the departure from all we hold, you know, dear, which we cling on to in our lives, that we've got to leave all this and go into death. But when you, the poet looks at the bigger picture, the larger scheme of things, then these 
this is nothing he is returning to his original all right so he wishes to leave happily and calm in this calm frame of mind so therefore he says and he states uh, faces this condition you know it's almost as when when i put out to see you see that throughout the poem he keeps talking about when when i put out to see when that which draws out when i embark when i have crossed the bar it's not repetition just like that there is a reason why he repeats when so often he is actually discussing what he is going to do when such a situation occurs all right and you can see that throughout the poem there is a definite passage of time time is moving forward may we have the next slide and i would refer you to a text that you studied a play that you studied in your earlier classes in classes 9 and 10 when antonio is talking to his friend salarino and salanio he talks about a full tide and his friends talk about the fear that a low tide uh, you know uh, that a low tide might catch his ship and the ship might flounder and here that's what he's saying he's saying but such a tide as moving sleeps asleep you know that though there is life in that tide it is absolutely calm it is so full that it cannot contain sound or food and therefore seems asleep too full for sand and when that and again the wind that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again the that that is the soul the human soul the boundless deep is in for infinity or eternity all of us have come from eternity and at a certain point we will now depart from this world and start our homeward journey so the word homeward becomes very important none of us are afraid of going home similarly the poet also is not afraid of going all right and then you see in the next stanza there is a passage of time the gloom deepens and the poet records it in his words he says twilight and evening bell all right so sunset has moved into twilight it has become twilight the darkness has increased and an evening bell as you know that in in a ship think about the tempest all right and all your texts in a way are interconnected you will find so in a ship very often on a ship the bell is rung to indicate the passage of time and here this bell as he says an evening bell this announces the end of day and the advent of the darkness again is metaphorical isn't it because the darkness of death death is always somehow associated with dark so he says that twilight and evening bell and he is well aware the next slide please and after that the dark and what does he say again and me there be no sadness of farewell when i am back so he anticipates his death his final journey and he states quite clearly that he does not want any sadness of farewell you know when people are bidding him the final farewell there's a lot of mourning there's a lot of crying people are reluctant to, to let their loved one go and he and the soul also which is embarking on its uh, final journey the soul also you know feels unhappy to go or the person or the soul unhappy to go he does not know where he is going but the poet 
poet is not in such a frame of mind. Now, interestingly, as I said, this poem was written just three years before the poet died. You know, it's almost foreshadowing his death. And he's leaving a set of preconditions, almost. Preconditions to what should happen. How should he, of course, preconditions for himself and also preconditions for the people around him? How should they, uh, you know, how should they prepare themselves for his death? How should they behave? Because he is quite certain that he's leaving with a quiet and calm mind and because he's completely prepared for this journey. And let's look at the line again. And may there be no sad of farewell when I embark. So he's already from when I put out to sea, that was in the first stanza, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. And then he says, when I embark. All right. So the idea, the nautical imagery is carried through in the poem because he's talking about embarking. You embark on a cloud voyage. Only in the poet's case, he's embarking on his final voyage, his voyage into eternity. All right. And eternity might frighten most people, but it doesn't frighten the poet at all. He's not at all frightened by thoughts of eternity because absolutely sure of what is going to happen. Now think of the context in which this poem was written. All right. The world in which this poem was written. Now as a result of all these uh, philosophical thoughts which were coming, the scientific thoughts which were coming, obviously people were all at sea, if I can use a metaphor. And because they were all at sea, there was a lot of disturbance, a lot of questioning in people's minds and you know they wondered whether there was a heaven was was there was there a hell is there a god at all all right and you find that each person during this time which we loosely talk about as the victorian age all the thinkers had their own what should you should use the modern word take they had the modern their own take on the situation how exactly what what exactly will the world be like? Also, of course, death would be a very important uh, idea in, in this context. So they were thinking about all this. And here you have the poet laureate or laureate was of, was the representative poet of the age. Very often the poet laureate uh, reflected the thoughts of the time. So in this particular you know, a poem. Uh, Tennyson seems to be, you know, building up a case for positivity. The only other poet who really was very positive in this age was Robert Browning. In his song, Paper Passes, he told, there is the line, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. And that, that's a very strong statement to be made. And I purposely mentioned this because you will understand why when we come to the last line of the poem. All right. So there is no disturbance of sorrow or lamentation in the poet's mind. And then, of course, next slide, the last stanza, the poet acknowledges uh, why people fear. All right. He acknowledges the fact that all of us fear death for certain reasons. You see, when, when we are in our lives, you know, when we are living our lives, there are two things that bind us to our lives. One is time. And we constantly refer to time. In this poem also, there is the concept of time, isn't it? We started with sunset and we've gone into twilight and the poet is always all looking forward to dark. And after that, the dark. All right, so time has progress. All of us think about time. All right, because time roots us in a place. And the other one is place, which is why, if you notice in the poem, time and place are written in capitals. Suddenly, in the middle of a sentence, you've got 
time and place and they are written in capitals why because the poet wants to give us he wants to give that that importance that time and place have very big you know roles to play in our lives and the uh, the idea of death is frightening why because we go into a place i won't even call it a world we go into a place where there is no concept of time and that place itself is undefined it doesn't have boundaries it doesn't have borders it doesn't have territory so where are we going hmm? so long you know up till this moment all christian souls knew that they would be going to heaven and god's in his heaven and all's right with the player world now suddenly due to all these ideas which were coming you know the very idea they, it had shaken them a lot the foundations of thought had been shaken so naturally you know he realizes that people fear death why and he acknowledges it also for though he realizes why people say this he says for though from out are born born is boundaries all right of time and place so he recognizes the fact that all of us need boundaries in our life and if we don't have boundaries completely we feel again to use the sea imagery the nautical imagery we feel cast adrift that we are all at sea because we need things to uh, we need our moorings as we say so he says that for though from our, our bone of time and place the flood and what is the flood the flood is dead and just as a flood now you have read the papers you might have watched news have you seen what's happened in hyderabad the rush of water so what happens when there's a rush of water we cannot hold on to ourselves isn't it the flood sweeps us away so does he mean to say that death will sweep us away from all that we hold familiar from all that we you know hold which which is just important to us so he says the flood may bear me far so death death will take him away from these boundaries of time and place but he says after death there will be no time and there will be no place so then what is he supposed to do again is assured and he is completely assured there's no doubt in his mind and that is again something that's very important very reassuring to his readers because here's a man who's lived his entire life lived through the upheavals of his age the victorian age which apparently seemed to be so secure so calm such a happening place in your language you know so so many things was happening victoria was the empress queen victoria the english empire the british empire stretched from one corner of the world to the other britain was very very rich so you have all these assurances but there was also that under tug you know that sense of displacement because things were happening too fast again you can compare that to what we are facing today you know we were so very sure of ourselves till march i'm sure all of us were leading our lives as we did and then suddenly there came this pandemic and you can compare it as a, to a flood also because it swept us off our feet all that we considered normal and we had to sit and reevaluate to introspect to think again and that's where we get the term today the new normal isn't it that we are thinking rethinking our lives the way we did things you know uh, who thought that i would i didn't think that i would ever teach you in front of a, co a computer looking at a black screen this was not our way of teaching 
you know, and trying to build a connect like this. So can you imagine today with the help of uh, our, our knowledge has expanded, there has been a knowledge explosion. So we, in a way, are better prepared to face new challenges. But in, in, those, in, in the 19th century, all right, they did not have, they were not as well equipped. And therefore, the idea of being completely swept away would be something that would be very, very frightening to the thinkers of the age. Because they would, they would not know what to replace it with. They would need to replace it, you know, what was being carried away from their lives with something else. And that was not happening. All right, or it would take some time till you know when there's a disbalance, <coughs> it takes some time. The pendulum has to swing before it comes to a balance. So that's what the poet is talking about. That this flood, which is taking him away, and not only him, he realizes perhaps, but also his fellow human beings. Because remember, this poem is being written in 1889. And if you just take one incident, Darwin's origin of the species was written in 89. So already, you know, he's lived through all the upheaval that had been caused. And because of the upheaval, probably even he had to introspect. He had to think. And he had to reaffirm his faith and belief. So what does the poet say? I hope. You know, it's very important to ponder upon important words in this poem. The poet has just not written these words just by chance. He has used words. So the poem ends on a note of hope. Just as in the darkling thrush, there is a note of hope. Where is the note of hope? Through the thrush. The thrush who sings in full-hearted song. You know, that an aged thrush Frail, gaunt, and small, in blast be ruffled you. And you and I, when we think of the age, we think of the storms of the age, we can understand which blast must have uh, hit the age. The storm, you know, that of, of that uh, storm of thoughts, of beliefs, of up, uprooting of beliefs, which must have. And the bird perhaps represents that. It blooms are be ruffled by the blast. And still the bird finds some cause for ecstatic sound. All right. And that's why the poet ends the whole poem with that in spite of the gathering gloom and darkness, that's what he says in the darkling touch. It's so interesting that you've got three poets uh, roughly around the same time. And the tone of the poems, more or less, each poet reaches a kind of a resolution in each of the poems through his understanding of the situation in which he finds himself. And he says, uh, Thomas Hardy, he says that, that in the bird's happy good night air, there was some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was unaware. It ends on a note of hope that there might be some hope somewhere. So I might not be able. And what does um, Matthew Arnold say? He doesn't talk about hope, but he also talks about one way of facing the situation in which they find themselves. And the situation is what? Our love. Let us be true to one another. So it's human relationships. The bonding that we have with each other. That, you know, the world might be all cast adrift, but there is a bonding. And he turns to his beloved and he says, our love, let us be true to one another. And so it's only love or human fellowship that will see us out of this. And now let us see what Alfred Lord Tennyson says. He says, I hope to see my pilot Face to face. So we've talked about hope. Now we talk about pilot. Now, who is a pilot? Now, when a ship arrives at a harbor from the sea and enters a river or, or is leaving a river and entering the sea, 
you generally because the channels of the water body in which the ship has entered might be difficult might be treacherous so you often need a pilot so a pilot actually guides the ship out for example you got pilots who guide the ships through the suez canal or the panama canal so the pilot's role is to guide all right now here let us look at the metaphorical situation he is saying i hope to see my pilot face to face only a person of deep faith could think about pilot you know the pilot or the maker so the deep conviction that he has that he will meet his maker or his pilot the pilot being the god or the supreme being who will guide him into a happy a benign content afterlife so he says i hope to see my pilot and how it will not be a dark nebulous figure not there the pilot will be there he see the pilot face to face he will see the face of his god so i hope to see my pilot face to face when i have crossed the bar. so he will see his maker once he's crossed the barrier between life and death the sandbar between life and death next slide please in this context the image of crossing becomes telepathy in the christian context it refers to the act of crossing over to the next world all right so the metaphorical or allegorical link is complemented with a spiritual one the pilot will guide the sailor in his journey into the vast sea the sea is uncharted it is limitless all right it doesn't have boundary it has but you know i mean when you think about the sea it is so vast so huge all right so the sea of eternity and he's talking about the sea is talking about eternity and eternity has no limits so therefore his maker will guide him in his journey into the past similarly god will guide him as he crosses over to his eternal life so do you see that throughout the poem there is this deep note of conviction the poet refuses to entertain any kind of you know doubts or fears or any thing like that no negativity it's a very positive poem and not a stridently positive poem you've got many poems which are very strident all right very loud this is a very calm very quiet poem why because the poet does not need to shout to make himself heard he doesn't need to shout he doesn't have to assert himself because he knows and when you know there's a deep conviction and that is the conviction it is out of the conviction of the poet of the writer of the person who he is that this poem has been born all right and interestingly tennyson wanted this poem to be placed at the end he was a prolific poet to be placed at the end of all his collection of poems all right so it sort of leaves gives us a message the poet seems to be leaving us with a message that you know this is the uh, you know that this is his belief and because it is such a strong belief he would want i would like to just refer you to two more poets who talked about death but in a completely different manner and perhaps if you have time with all of you in front of your computers the whole day nowadays so one is death be not proud by john donne let's look at the poem you will find it on the net and where the poet talks about fighting death he sees death as a challenge which has to be overcome and he ends his poem with the with the with the line death 
thou shalt die. I will not allow you to intimidate me. And therefore, I shall overcome death. And we have another poem, which is written by Dylan Thomas. It was in the ISC course a couple of years ago. Uh, um, Dylan Thomas is a 20th century poet, all right? Whereas Tun was a 17th century poet. And Dylan Thomas writes a poem called, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. You see, darkness, night, these are associations always with death. And this poem is an address to his father and his father who is old. And he tells his father that do not go tamely into death. Fight it, face it. All right? Fight it like a warrior. Do not get it. So you find it will be interesting reading. And certainly the three poems in your course when you are studying them, study them together. It makes for a very good insight into the thought processes of contemporary. Uh, we look at the assignments that we have got for you. The next slide, please. Uh, perhaps you could do this, these assignments so that you know, you clarify your thoughts a lot. You understand what the poem is all about. And it will help you. The first one is describe the ruling mood of the poem. And you're welcome here to compare it with the other two poems in your course. And the next one is, of course, and this will take some research. <coughs> you're already doing uh, research for your projects, discuss the intellectual and philosophical turmoil of the age when this poem was written. And another one, which is a comparison, in what way is the poem Crossing the Bar different from Dover Beach and the Darkling? And I'm sure if you put your minds to it, you will be able to find your The, the first question, what is the significance of the title in the poem Crossing the Bar? You can see how important it is. Literally speaking, it is crossing the bar. The, po the sailor, now let's not talk about the poet. The poet in the persona of the sailor is setting out to sea. And if he is setting out to sea, he would need to cross sandbar that that forms a ridge, all right, before he can go into the open sea. But it, at the metaphorical level, he's talking about crossing all those impediments that stop us from facing death, that frighten us from facing death. Crossing the bar, metaphorically, crossing the barrier between life and Sunset and evening star. All right. Sunset, as I said right at the beginning of the lesson, the sunset of our lives. All right. At uh, the end of our lives, as we move towards old age and we anticipate that the end of our lives is coming, we talk about sunset. So sunset and evening star. The star that comes up in the sky, of course, it's Venus. As you know, it's a very bright star. And which indicates that the day is at an end and night is about to begin. And of course, night here means the night of our lives. Isn't it the end of our lives? Clear call. Why does the poet use the word? Clear call. Why? Because for him, you know, take it in the context of the age where there was a lot of confusion 
isn't it? There was a lot of confusion, doubts, fears about what was happening, how was the, uh, what will happen. All right. So therefore, but the poet feels that he will give a clear call. There is no confusion in this case. He does not, uh, he does not contribute, shall we say, to the doubts, the fears, the confusions, which were, you know, uh, which were uh, there amongst the other thinkers of the age. He doesn't have such doubts and confusions. He's clear, he knows that the call from his maker to set out on his for, uh, final journey will be a clear one for him. He, the, the sea, literally, it means the sea. To what does the poet compare the sea? Literally, of course, it means the sea. Metaphorically, the sea of eternity. It's so vast. Anything that's vast is normally compared to a sea or an ocean. All right. So here the sea is the sea of eternity. I refer to the merchant of Venice for this. He wants a full tide so that it literally again speaking, the tide is. Uh, you know, if it's full, the journey is a placid and a peaceful one. But if the waters, uh, uh, well, the water is not there, then the ship is apt to run aground. So he does not want, and it's a full tide. There will be no the ship will not graze against the bar. So if it's a full tide, so a full he wants to go out right at the height when everything is calm and serene as it is. When there is a full time. Yes, not only mourning the sadness, the grief, you know, when you say mourning of the poet's well wishers, it can be sadness, it can be grief, it can be unhappiness. Since he is not unhappy, to leave this world with its boundaries of time and place. He does not want the people around him, his well-wishers, to be unhappy too. Yes, it refers to the boundary, our world, a world which is defined by the concepts of time and place. Our world is always our lives. You will find. Think about your lives. You'll find that it's always by time and place. You know, I'm defined by my area. Wherever I'm staying, I'm defined by the time speaking. So that so our boundaries, these are the boundaries that add a structure to our lives. Now eternity is structureless. So therefore, from out a born of time and place. Yes. Well, you could in interpret it that way, but why would the soul carry him far? Should tide be death? And the boundless sea, why would it be a metaphor and metonymy for God? You know, this is a too extreme an idea, but then literature is inter interpretive, is personal, and there's always a personal interpretation and a personal, uh, you know, reaction to poetry. So if you feel that way, you would only have to answer it, but if enough, uh, you know, you have to enough give back up for why you feel that. Spelling of monologue is wrong. Uh, the poem is not a dramatic monologue because who is he speaking to? We don't feel the presence of a speaker. In a dramatic monologue, you must feel the presence of a speaker who, you know, and the, and the, uh, the presence of the listener, sorry, not the speaker. And the speaker who is speaking, you know, the listener will be giving him cues. So he's talking to all and sundry. I won't call it. It's a reflective poem. He's reflecting upon this thing. 
I would not call it a dramatic move. It's not melancholy, it's not depressing, it's not sad. There is a note of hope, otherwise he would not say, I hope to see. And he's not depressed about his death at all. He's looking forward to it. So how would we call it uh, 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 a, a depressing poem? And which last poem illustrates its tone is the last line. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. He is absolutely sure. And most of this age, this surety is very important. That he's absolutely there's no doubt in his mind that he is going to meet his maker face to face when he's crossed that bar between life. I personally feel there is no trepidation in the poem. It's a response to the trepidation of the age. We've talked about the word cross, and there are, I know, in interpretations which are which you might have read, which is why you've come to the word crossed. And we talk about the Christian crossing and the cross itself. I think it's too far fetched. The idea of just crossing, crossing over, all right, from life into death. Of course, I've read what you, uh, you know, where I know where you are getting the uh, question from. I've read the same things. If you feel it is that way, perhaps it is, but I, I don't contribute. As I've said earlier, literature is interpretive in me. They have often said the Christian act of crossing is mentioned by that. Yes, darkness, the darkness of death, the darkness of eternity, because we know very little about eternity. So he's going from the known, the world which we know of is going from the known into the unknown. So therefore, there is that darkness. He is sad to leave himself because he himself is not sad to leave. He does not want and sadness or mourning, as he said, is sort of it sort of holds you back, doesn't it? It 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 will impinge on, it will impede the calm and serene uh, state of mind in which he wishes to face death. He does not want that serenity, and serenity is such a lovely word. He does not want that serenity to be disturbed in any way. They start with capital letters, yes, not block letters. Uh, they start with capital letters and holds a special significance. Pilot, of course, because he's talked about the pilot, and I've told you in a real world what a pilot is. Even when a VIP goes, there's a pilot uh, car which goes ahead to clear the way. So it's actually guiding him through the traffic. In the harbor, it's the pilot who guides the ship out to the sea. All right, so the pilot is the maker, and because he wishes to give the pilot that kind of emphasis, that kind of significance, therefore the word maker is in charge with a capital. Time and place also is used capitals because to explain the importance of time and place in our lives. How important time and place is. No, it's becoming too far-fetched. Why should we, you know, when we're talking about death, why should we talk about Christ's birth? He's not going to die and then see Christ's birth. I mean, no. The evening star, any stars, actually the pole star. The symbolic meaning is that the power, the impediment, the barrier that there is stayed, that's, that is there between life and death. You know, there are many barriers that I've said 
uh, earlier there are internal barriers the external barriers also the, these are the barriers which we have to face when you know we are dying people are dying you know there's always uh the poet's frame of mind as i said it's very calm very serene very collected and also this frame of mind is born out of his deep faith he is very assured there's no doubt in his mind so there are no ifs and buts remember he keeps on saying when when all right so he's looking forward to a time when when we use the word when it's when i will take this lesson when i will attend a lesson all right and me these are the conditions in which he wants to meet the thank you so much i think that was the last poem a last question it was a pleasure teaching all